Kanpur, India, July 1857. We've been here before. Another small British garrison is under siege from a large Indian army. Seeing the hopelessness of their situation, the garrison surrenders, and the British leave their position on the promise of a safe withdrawal. Though they leave behind some 200 women and children, under the assumption that the attackers are only interested in forcing British troops to retreat. It's a familiar story up to this point, but the end of it shows how much things have changed on the subcontinent. Because the siege of Kanpur occurred in the midst of a bloody escalation in the rebellion of 1857. Shortly after their surrender, the besiegers fire on the British garrison, nearly wiping it out. And several days later, the Indian army murders the women and children, throwing their bodies down a well. After decades of half-measures, false starts, and paradoxes, the conquest of India is about to reach its hideously violent conclusion. Thanks so much to Bright Sellers for raising a glass to history and sponsoring this episode. Following the trial of Warren Hastings and the India Act of 1784, the EIC continued to run things on the ground in India, but increasingly the influence of the Nabob was being replaced by the British government itself. This shift in direction brought on a massive change in the style of the British Raj, or British rule. Whereas Hastings had argued that the British should rule these people according to their own ideas, manners, and prejudices to avoid conflict, the new British administrators of the 19th century were more interested in making India as British as possible. This impulse to civilize India, as they put it, took hold in the 1820s, during a period called the Age of Reform. This reform, which lasted into the 1850s, included attempts to spread Christianity, promote English language, introduce the study of Western science and philosophy, and reshape the Indian court system with British law. Hey, this is starting to sound like an actual conquest. Exactly, Army. These are the types of actions you expect a foreign imperial power to take, but they just confusingly occurred decades after Clive's victory at Plassey, like a virus that took over 60 years to activate. As the subcontinent entered the 1850s and the last vestiges of the Mughal system were scrubbed away, the resistance to the British Empire began to change as well. Whereas the EIC had presented itself as just another regional Indian power interested in wealth, the British government represented a threat to the very foundation of Indian life a threat that would lead to a dramatic response in the near future. Meerut, India, May 10th, 1857. Eighty-five Indian members of the Bengal Light Cavalry are sitting in jail. They've been placed there for refusing to use their weapons. These soldiers, made up of Muslims and Hindus, have heard a rumor. The British have been lubricating the cartridges of their Enfield rifles with pig fat, cow fat, or both. And these new cartridges require soldiers to bite off the greased ends before loading their weapons, thus forcing Muslims to ingest pork and Hindus to ingest beef. Now, in decades past, this situation may have led to a compromise solution between the EIC and their sepoys. I mean, duck fat anyone? Come on. But in 1857, after years of living with Britain's civilizing mission, these greased cartridges represent the cherry on top of the Raj's culturally and racially insensitive Sunday. Incensed by the treatment of their fellow soldiers and by decades of ignorant British rule, the remaining Indian members of the Bengal Light Cavalry rise up and break the 85 out of jail. They then pick up their Enfield rifles, loaded with their greased cartridges, and shoot their British officers before marching to Delhi. The rebellion that followed, often called the Sepoy Mutiny, was never really about the cartridges. It was about rejecting cultural imperialism and racial injustice. The war for India had begun. By the time the sepoys from Meerut reached Delhi, they were joined by thousands of peasants and local leaders, who were just as upset about British civilization as the soldiers were. Then, after helping the sepoys capture Delhi, the rebels declared Baradur Shah, the Mughal emperor who essentially lived under an EIC guard detail, to be their leader. Unfortunately for the rebels, most of India didn't join their resistance. Even as the rebellion caught fire in the north, there were few outbreaks of mutiny anywhere else. Plus, the rebels came from different walks of life, which meant there was little cohesion in their reasons for revolt. Peasants in their ranks wanted an end to the cycle of famine, local leaders wanted a restoration of their old power and traditions, and the sepoys wanted the chance for better pay and respect. The British, on the other hand, possessed a clear objective, revenge. Just like with the Black Hole of Calcutta, the massacre at Kanpur galvanized British soldiers. Believing they were justified, the British gave in to their worst impulses. Soldiers competed with one another to execute mutinous prisoners of war and murdered them using barbaric means, including execution by cannon. British troops then took the bodies of rebels and hung them on roads and in bazaars across the subcontinent. 
using loyal sepoys and these brutal tactics. The British brought an end to the hostilities in 1859. In the aftermath of the rebellion, the British government heaped blame on the East India Company, even though it was the government and not the EIC that directed the Age of Reform. The EIC was relieved of control of India and replaced in time by a new colonial bureaucracy based in London. In addition to the removal of the EIC, the British also did away with the farce of the Mughal Empire. They exiled Bahadur Shah and executed all of his potential successors. Interestingly, however, the new British Raj didn't do away with the symbols of the Mughal era. Indeed, in an effort to avoid the mistakes of the Age of Reform, the British actively attempted to bring back the look, feel, and pageantry of the Mughal Empire in an attempt to smooth over differences. And this culminated in 1877, when Queen Victoria was proclaimed Empress of India during the Raj's first Delhi Durbar. Now, the British crown already possessed India, but this proclamation and the Durbar were meant to show that Victoria was the rightful successor to the Mughal crown. It was a move that would have made Warren Hastings proud. But by the time of the first British Durbar, too much had changed. Because while the Durbar was designed to link the present with the past in a way that would appeal to Indians, turns out the most influential Indians at this time were now only interested in the future. And the Durbar in 1877 gave us a hint of that future. Thousands gathered for a massive coronation. But Victoria, the guest of honor, their new empress, just like Edward VII back in episode 1, didn't show up. Not only that, but the preparation for this spectacle drew support away from an ongoing famine that would cost the lives of some four million people. India was finally conquered, but despite the importance of this prize, it would always be held at arm's length and ruled with criminal neglect by the British. And nearly a century would pass before India could throw off the yoke of their absentee landlords. When we think about the end of empires, we usually think of a climactic event, like the sacking of a city or the assassination of an emperor. But with the conquest of the Mughal Empire, we get a very long, very drawn-out, confusing decline. And because the decline lasted decades, there were plenty of opportunities for things to turn out differently. In the 50 years between Aurangzeb's death and the Battle of Blasi, we could have seen the emergence of another great Mughal emperor. Heck, we could have seen the ultimate success of another European power on the subcontinent. And it wasn't until a full century and a half of British presence that they established a clear advantage, and even then, there were plenty more hiccups and problems to come, like the rebellion of 1857 before a full conquest. This is why this story defies easy retellings, but it's also why this story has such verve. Oh man, the full story really bucks the old simple tale of European conquest, doesn't it? I mean, the British only won because they inadvertently became enshrined in the Mughal system of governance. A paradox indeed. Aw, oh, I'm proud of you, Army. Finally seeing the forest through the trees, huh? Now, of course, even if the Mughal Empire maintained its own power, they would have gotten some things wrong, too. There still would have been diseases, famines, and wars to deal with. But those would have been India's mistakes to make and problems to solve. The fact is, people want to rule themselves, even when there's risks involved. And when things do go wrong, it helps the population to know that someone local is in charge, who shares their concerns and attitudes. But with the British Raj, India was too often left with an empty chair. Hey! Oh, sorry, no offense, bud. I know, I'm just playing. <laughs> oh, Army, you've come a long way. What say we toast to the completion of this series with a nice glass of wine from our friends at Bright Cellars? Now, there are two things you should know about me when it comes to wine. One, I really enjoy having it on hand, especially with the upcoming influx of holiday guests. And two, I know absolutely nothing about selecting a good wine. Seriously, before Bright Cellars, I was just picking bottles based on the labels, and that got dicey quick. Bright Cellars is a monthly wine club that's made my process of wine selection an absolute breeze. Not only do they source their wines from small vineyards all over the world, but they also set up a super easy and fun seven-question quiz each month that gathers your taste preferences to deliver you wines you're guaranteed to love. For instance, when I took the quiz, they gave me a question about what chocolate I could eat for the rest of my life. But then I got to select the outside-the-box answer, where's the fruit candy? It's like these folks already know me. Then in a few days, my custom curated box of wine showed up at my door. And while it was super cool to see what Bright Cellars selected for me, it was doubly so when they were right on the money. My favorite being the Ochevado Sauvignon Blanc, which really nailed that bright fruity acidity I was looking for. Whereas Jeff told me he and his wife really dug the Austrian Hertz and Heim Zweigelt, a light-bodied red with notes of cherry cola, raspberry, and warm brown baking spices that pairs great with a pork schnitzel. Wait a minute, hold on, Jeff. Where'd you get all this wine knowledge? Ooh, that's right, the wine wisdom cards. For each bottle in your box, they send along a card that outlines the tasting notes, suggested pairings, best serving temperature, and origin. Basically, a neat little mini class filled with info so you can feel like a sommelier at your next dinner party or when you're writing ad reads. Wink. 
So assuming you're of the appropriate drinking age in your neck of the woods, how would you like to get all of that goodness delivered right to your door and a great deal to boot? Well, right now, you can get your first six bottles from Bright Cellars for 50% off by using our link in the description below. That's six bottles for just $45, meaning it's less than $8 a bottle for wine curated to your personal taste, which is just bananas. The deal, I mean, not the flavor you want your wine to be, but you know, no judgment. And when you sign up, not only will your taste buds be tantalized, but you'll also be supporting our channel in the process. Cheers to your support. That's right, Zoe. Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One are fantastic legendary patrons. 